So we are going to find the flux of the following vector field across the unit sphere centered at the origin. Notice that in the question it doesn't specify which direction we want to calculate the flux in, but remember that there's a convention when it's not specified in the question. If your surface is closed, then you're calculating outward flux. And if your surface is not closed, if it's something like this, then you're calculating upward flux. And the reason why we have that convention is just so that we don't have to specify in every problem in which direction we want to calculate the flux. Since in this scenario, we're talking about the unit sphere that's centered at the origin, we're in this situation where we've got a closed surface. And so we know that we're going to be calculating the outward flux. So let's write outward for a closed surface so that um, when that comes up in this question, we'll have already thought about that convention. So there are a couple of ways to proceed with this problem. Uh, we need a formula for our surface. So you could do this in rectangular coordinates and you could say x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. And you could go ahead and you could solve that for z and approach it that way. Or another way to do it would be to um, consider the unit sphere as a parametric surface. So that's what we're going to do here. And if we wanted to describe this unit sphere in terms of two parameters, the easiest way to do that would be to get this written in terms of spherical coordinates. So let's think about changing our coordinates x, y, and z over to cylindrical. And then from cylindrical, we'll move into spherical. Cylindrical is just usually a good middle ground between rectangular and spherical. So for cylindrical, we would say x is equal to r cos theta, y is equal to r sine theta, and in cylindrical, z just is equal to z. And then we could draw our special triangle in spherical coordinates to help us move all the way into spherical. So the angle phi is measured from the positive z axis. This distance here is 3D distance. That's what we're going to call rho. That's our distance in the vertical direction, z. And then r is our distance in the xy plane. OK, so we can look at this triangle and we could say, well, r is the same thing as rho sine phi. So we would say x equals rho sine phi cos theta. y would be rho sine phi sine theta. And then to get z in spherical coordinates, looking at our triangle, we would say z is rho cos phi. OK, so right now that involves three variables, rho, phi, and theta. But what we're trying to describe is the unit sphere that's centered at the origin. So that means we're using a rho value of 1. And so x becomes sine phi cos theta y becomes sine phi sine theta, and z becomes cos phi. So I'll just write dot, dot, dot. So the way we're going to record all this information is we're actually going to write down the position vector, which we'll call vector r. Um, and that's just going to describe the types of points that we've got on our surface, but describe them in terms of our two parameters. OK, so plugging in rho equal 1 into these three formulas, we get sine phi cos theta, sine phi sine theta, and then finally cos phi. OK, and then we can think about uh, recording the values that we're going to use for phi and theta. So let's just think about spherical coordinates. So we've got this nice sphere here, unit sphere centered at the origin. Phi is the angle measured from the positive z-axis. So if we think about what phi values we need to capture across this whole unit sphere, everything from 0 to pi. And then theta represents our amount of rotation in the xy direction. So we want to go all the way around that unit sphere, and theta will be going from 0 to 2 pi. All right, so we'll use these values when we actually set up our double integral little bit later in the problem. So let's just flash back to how to calculate NDS for a parametric surface. We say it's going to be either plus or minus r sub u crossed with r sub v du dv. 
Uh, the only catch here is that our parameters are actually called phi and theta. So if I just name change here, we would go r sub phi crossed with r sub theta and then d phi d theta and we'll choose the plus or minus as is appropriate. We know we're going to be calculating outward flux so we'll just choose whatever sign takes us outwards. All right, so let's get into the partial derivative portion of the calculation. We'll calculate r sub phi and r sub theta and we're just looking up at our position vector that we built up at the top of the screen there. Okay, so taking our partial derivatives with respect to phi, we'd have cos phi, cos theta, cos phi sine theta, and then minus sine phi. And then taking partials with respect to theta, we'd have minus sine phi sine theta, we'd have sine phi cos theta, and then the last one is the nicest one, it's just zero. All right, so now we want to take the cross product of these guys. So r sub phi crossed with r sub theta. Let's think of this as a three by three determinant. We'll just give ourselves lots of room to write here. So we'll write our ijk, write out our vectors. And then remember, in terms of expanding this determinant, we'll expand along the top row and we will see alternating signs as we do that. So we'll just watch that J term. All right, so we're going to go vector i times, we're going to do this little two by two determinant here. So that's going to be a positive sine squared phi cos theta. And then we're going to go minus J times, we're crossing out the row and column with the J in it. Um, and our determinant, we're going to have triple negative here. So minus sine squared phi sine theta. And then finally plus vector k times we'll do just that little two by two determinant there. Okay, so let's do this on the next line just to give ourselves room to write. So when you multiply these guys together, notice there's gonna be that cos squared theta that comes up. So we could call this, um, let's say sine phi cos phi cos squared theta. And then when we subtract off the backwards product, that's now be gonna become plus, we get quite a similar term. It's sine phi cos phi sine squared theta. So whenever you see this pattern of something times a cos squared theta plus that same thing times the sine squared theta, see, we're gonna be able to factor this. This stuff in the brackets is sine phi cos phi times cos squared theta plus sine squared theta and that part there just gives us one. So in other words, everything we're getting in the bracket is just sine phi cos phi. So it's good to be able to recognize that quickly in this type of problem, just so that we do a minimum of writing. So let's put our vector back in component form. So the i component, sine squared phi cos theta. Um, the j component gonna be positive, sine squared phi, sine theta, and then finally we've got sine phi cos phi. Okay, so there was a little bit of algebra to do, but um, this is looking good at this point. And then to get our integrand figured out, we need to turn this into NDS. So we're gonna say plus or minus this thing, which I'll just call r sub phi crossed with r sub theta, times d phi d theta. Okay, so let's think about the plus or minus sign here. We already decided that since we're working with a closed surface, we want to choose the outwards direction. Anytime your surface is closed, your flux is going to be outwards unless otherwise specified. Um, so let's think about whether the plus or the minus sign is going to correspond to an outwards direction. So here's our sphere, and um, to figure this out, I would say let's just think about what's going on with the z component of our normal vector. So if you were on the upper hemisphere, your normal vector going out would look like that, and if you were on the lower, if you were on the lower hemisphere here, um, your outward normal vector would look like that. 
Okay, so outwards means that z is going to be positive when phi is somewhere between 0 and pi over 2. So that's just like saying if you're anywhere on the upper hemisphere where phi is between 0 and pi over 2, um, you want the z component to be positive so that that n is pointing up. That's what corresponds to outwards. See, so if your normal vector were going like this, z would be negative, that would be pointing inwards. So we are reducing the problem just to thinking about the z component. And then similarly, if you were on the lower hemisphere, so down here, okay, well, if we think about the phi values in that range, phi would be now bigger than pi over 2, could be as big as pi. So we're capturing this whole portion for lower hemisphere. Um, we would want z to be negative for those phi values. That's what's making our unit vector go outwards. So if you thought about uh, the opposite of what we want, if you thought about a vector going in this way, see now the z component would be positive. So it is good enough just to think about the z component there. Um, if you wanted to do this quickly, you could even just think about one of these cases. Okay, so then let's look up at our vector, r sub phi cross r sub theta. Here it is. And we're basically saying, well, we just want to make sure that our z component, which is this guy, we want to make sure this guy is positive when we choose an angle between 0 and pi over 2. So we want to choose the plus sign. We don't need to change the sign here. So if we put an angle between 0 and pi over 2 in here, yep, that's going to come out positive, and that's what we want. And you can check, just really to confirm our reasoning here, if you did take an angle that was between pi over 2 and pi, and you put it in here, well, sine of phi will be positive, but cos of phi will be negative. So overall, this thing is going to come out negative when we choose phi values between pi over 2 and pi, um, and that's also what we want. So that corresponds to, in our picture, if we're on the lower hemisphere, we want our outward vector to be going this way. So that's the geometry of how we choose the sign. We've decided we're going to choose the positive sign there. So in conclusion, we can say NDS then is going to be just r sub phi crossed with r sub theta d phi d theta because we're choosing that positive sign. And I think I will write this down in terms of components just so that we don't have to keep scrolling. So let's look back at our r sub phi crossed with r sub theta. That's what we've got right up at the top of the screen here, and we'll just carry that down. Good. So that's often one of the hardest parts of these problems is just getting that figured out. And then in order to calculate our flux, we need to do the dot product of our vector field with this vector NDS. So if we think about what f was, it was given in the question. We'll look back at the beginning here. Um, f was minus y x z. OK, now the idea is that we want to get everything in the language of phi and theta. So we need to look back at our position vector, which gives us formulas for x, y, and z in terms of our parameters. So let's scroll back just to see where we where we had that written down. Um, so that was right around here. We actually built that position vector, so I think I'll recopy it so that we can see that in front of us. So our position vector was sine phi cos theta, sine phi sine theta, and then cos phi. Okay, so remember when you say position vector, you're just saying, hey, here are the formulas for x, y, and z just in terms of our new parameters. So this is x, this is y, this is z. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to write our vector field, which we're told in the problem is minus y, x, z. We want to write that in the language of phi and theta. Okay, so let's use the position vector here as a guide, and we'll just write minus y x z in our new language. 
So minus y is gonna be minus sine phi sine theta. X is going to be, I think I will just space this out a little bit so it's easier to read. So X is going to be sine phi cos theta. And then Z is going to be cos phi. Okay, so that vector F is going to get dotted with this NDS that we just calculated. So sine squared phi cos theta, sine squared phi sine theta, and sine phi cos phi times d phi d theta. Okay, and we can erase our position vector there. We don't need that anymore. Um, we just use that to plug into f. So in order to get our integrand, we just need to do this dot product. Um, and it looks a little scary at the moment, but the idea is that with so many sines and cosines floating around here, we know there's going to be cancellation. So in a couple minutes, this is going to look a lot nicer. So let's do our dot product in the usual way. We'll multiply the first components together. So that's going to be minus sine cubed phi times a sine phi times sine theta cos theta and then plus multiplying the second component components together sine cubed phi again we're seeing a sine theta cos theta term okay so um and then multiplying the third components together sine phi cos squared phi okay and all that stuff getting multiplied by d phi d theta. So let's get this cancellation going. So notice the beautiful thing that happens here. So first and second terms just completely cancel out. We got a negative version and a positive version of the same thing. So that's great. Um, and that gives us just a nice cos squared phi sine phi d phi d theta. So to calculate flux, the idea is that we're going to have to do a double integral of this thing just over the appropriate phi and theta values. And this thing is going to be pretty friendly to integrate. So we really are in the home stretch here. So let's write down our formula for flux. So capital phi, going to do the integral, double integral over our surface of f dot n ds. We've put all the work in now to calculating that thing. So we're going to say this is the double integral of cos squared phi sine phi d phi d theta. And um, strictly speaking, if you wanted to write a subscript here under the double integral, you'd call that r. r is just the range of values for your parameters. So we would just be looking back at the beginning to figure out what phi and theta values we would be using here. So let's look back to where we set up our position vector. And we said the idea here is that we're using spherical coordinates. So we're just going to use the usual range of values for phi and theta to capture that whole unit sphere. Phi should be ranging between 0 and pi, theta ranging between 0 and 2 pi. So we'll write that down and then get that onto our integral. OK, so that means instead of writing r here, I think I'll just directly put in our limits of integration. So phi going from 0 to pi to capture the whole top and bottom of our unit sphere, and then theta going from 0 to 2 pi to make sure that we're going all the way around that sphere. Good, so let's do our integration and then we will have our flux. So we'll keep our outside integral on there, keep our d theta on there, and then we're just going to integrate this cos squared phi times sine phi. So if you wanted, you could do a little substitution on the side, but the idea would be to let u equal cos phi, so that this thing here is like u squared, and then du would be minus sine phi d phi. So if you went through all the details of the substitution, you would not exactly get cos cubed phi over 3. You'd actually get the negative of that because your du is going to come out negative. So it's up to you whether you want to go through all the details or whether you want to just write that down quickly. So we get minus cos cubed phi over 3, and that needs to get evaluated at phi equal pi and phi equal 0. Okay, so let's figure that out. Subbing in phi equal pi, well, cos of pi is going to be negative 1, 
So this is going to give us negative negative 1, in other words, 1 third. And then subtracting off the value at 0, again, we're going to have a double negative kind of situation. So 2 thirds is what we're getting there. And then that has to get multiplied by uh, the integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta. So that part there is just giving us 2 pi. OK, so we got 2 thirds times 2 pi, in other words, 4 pi over 3 is our flux. So that was a lot of practice working with a parametric surface and calculating the flux across that parametric surface. So a couple of key steps that we had to do here, we had to actually create our position vector using our knowledge of spherical coordinates. So I would say that was the first kind of pressure point in the problem. And then we had to do the algebra of calculating NDS and choosing the correct direction. So that was this part here um, was, I would say, the second pressure point. And then once you've got that figured out, then you just trust that when you do your dot product of your vector field with NDS, that there will be a reasonable amount of cancellation that's going to happen. Um, and that's typically how these questions are going to flow. So you end up with an integrand that's typically not that bad. And then you can do a, a double integral and, and pretty quickly get your flux once, you're, once you've got your integrand figured out. So that is 3D flux for parametric surfaces. Thanks for watching.